hear you. Well, you know, some of my jackets have my initials in them or whatever, and I said, if I find it, it'll have my initials in it, but this one doesn't, okay? So again, if you hear anybody that lost a blue blazer, I'm probably wearing it, okay? All right, the, uh, um, okay. Um, let's go to God in prayer before we begin this morning. Our Father and our God in heaven, we praise your great and glorious name. Hallowed be thy name. And we thank you for being our God, and we thank you for all the bountiful blessings you've bestowed upon us. We thank you for the, all the physical blessings we have in this life, which make life easier to live and good for us, Lord. And we thank you for the, the unspeakable spiritual blessings that we find in the presence of your Son, who you sent here to live on this earth and to die a terrible death on the cross of Calvary for each one of us. We're thankful for that thankful for the blessings that uh, the spiritual blessings we have through the death burial and resurrection of your son Jesus we're thankful for opportunities like this that we have to assemble as people of like precious faith to study from your scriptures and in a little while to worship you in spirit and truth as you have commanded us to do pray that you'll be with uh, this class and all the classes that are meeting this morning that you'll give the teachers good re recollection of the things that they have prepared Lord that you'll be with the students, that they will listen attentively, and that much good will come from our various Bible studies in the various classes this morning. We're thankful for um, that you were with Mike and Reed and Madison as they labored doing your work um, and the work of your son um, in Vanuatu. We're thankful for their safe arrival back among us. We're thankful for what we hear was a good work that they, they were able to do. Thankful for the Thanks, sir, that are going on with your people in Vanuatu. In Vanuatu, we pray that you'll be with them, that you'll bless them in every good and positive way, and that your church will be strengthened throughout uh, that nation, Lord. Pray that you'll continue to be with uh, uh, Hope and Rachel as they are now in the Honduras. Pray that you'll bless them and keep them safe. Pray that you'll be with them and all that are doing that mission work in the Honduras place. Pray that much good will come from that and that your will will be advanced your word will be advanced that things can be done um, that are needful for the people there and that uh, more souls will be reached with the gospel of your son jesus uh, just pray that you'll continue to be with us in all things lord that you'll give us guidance that you'll give us direction help us to live in a manner that we should and uh, we pray all these things in the name of thy son amen all right, uh, let's go over to, if I can find it, we will begin this morning in Ephesians 4, beginning with verse 4, if I'll find the proper slide here in a moment, I hope I can anyway. We have said a number of times, we are now to the latter um, chapters of the book of Ephesians, and in these, uh, we will begin to consider and are considering the lives we live, how the church should live in the world. And indeed, we did spend two weeks studying Ephesians 4, verses 1 through 3, uh, and doing, having... Uh, studying them in detail and having a lot of really good uh, discussion about those verses, studying about those verses that talk about we are to walk worthy of the calling which, which we have been called, and we discussed exactly what that means, that we're to do that with humility, gentleness, patience, that we're to bear with one another with love, and indeed, we're to do everything we can, that we're to be diligent to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Okay, and we talked a lot about unity, and it is time for us to go on now. So we're going to continue on this morning in Ephesians 4. Uh, we're going to first of all read uh, verses 4 through 6, and then I hope, um, well, I'm certain we'll get through 4 through 6, and I hope we'll be able perhaps to even get through, seven through uh, verses 7 through 16 this morning. We'll see how it goes. In verses 4 through 6, Again, we've been doing a lot of discussion, had a lot of discussion about unity and the unity that we're to have. 
the unity that we're to keep as it has been given to us by the Holy Spirit. Um, and in verses 4, 6, we're kind of, I think, given the platform, if you will, for this unity. And all of these ones, uh, ones signifying unity, I think, and all of these ones that are spoken of here. Let's just reread as we begin this morning, Ephesians 4, verses 4 through 6. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, Molly wanted me to make this announcement. As I look in my audience this morning, maybe except for Brother Green, okay? <laughs> we don't have any parents of young ones. We have grandparents of young ones, though, and we were just the request is that we, you know, that we, yeah, our, our, our folks, as you can see, have been working tremendously hard. I was up here yesterday, and I didn't do much. I just kind of sat and watched, but we had people working tremendously hard here and other places in the church building getting ready for vacation Bible school, which begins tonight. So we kind of need to keep an eye on the kiddos and make sure all of this stuff stays together so it can be used uh, for uh, vacation Bible school beginning tonight. Remind you, I'm sure this is in our announcements this morning, uh, but uh, there will be an adult class each night, beginning tonight through Wednesday night. Um, and so we'll have the opportunity for us adults to have a class as vacation Bible school goes on. Okay, let's read Genesis 4, excuse me, Ephesians 4, verses 4 through 6. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called, in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Okay? So again, as I said a moment ago, it seems to me as we continue to consider unity, we're given kind of a platform for unity in these four verses here. Um, the unity we think about commanded, that's been commanded to us as a basis in these seven unities, uh, which we just read about, which, which were to exist in the church then, as Paul wrote to the Ephesian Christians, and should exist in the church in all ages. One body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and Father of all. Let's just consider these briefly a little bit. First of all, one body. We need to recognize um, that Paul is emphasizing here that there was then only one body, the body of Christ, the church as we've read elsewhere in the book of Ephesians. As Paul emphasized in the book of Ephesians and elsewhere in the New Testament, not a Gentile body and a Jewish body, but one body, all right? Um, and we need to understand that indeed, at that time, there was one body, and there should be one body today. We need to understand that modern denominations were unknown at this time. That again, Paul speaks of here, one body, okay? Let's see him emphasize that somewhere else. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, if you will. 1 Corinthians 12. First Corinthians 12, and we will read verses 12 and 13. This is another place where Paul, uh, in the 12th chapter of 1 Corinthians, where Paul indeed talks about unity and diversity in one body. But in verses 12 and 13, he says, For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body being many, or one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. Just to emphasize, notice again what he says in verse 13. For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body. So the one body, he goes on and he talks about the one spirit the same spirit being bestowed upon both Jew and Gentile, Paul would say, and upon all saints, including you and me. He continues on and he talks about one hope. One hope of our calling, he calls it here in, in, in um, Ephesians 4. One hope of our calling. 
whenever called and from whatever state, um, all of us are filled with one hope. What is that hope? He talks about one hope as you were called and one hope of your calling. What is that hope? What is the hope that we are called to? How would you describe it? Eternal life, okay. Didn't mean to cut you off, Steve. Eternal life, did you have anything else you wanted to say there? Whatever, okay. Eternal life, okay. One hope, eternal life. How else would you describe it? That's one of the things I wrote down, eternal life. There might be some other words we could put on it as we think about one hope of our calling or whatever, okay. But eternal life, anything else? Excuse me? I say that to be with Christ. To be with Christ, okay. All right. Eternal living. Excuse me? Eternity. Okay, there's that eternity again, okay? Eternity with Christ, eternal life. Any other thoughts of how what you think of when you think of one hope of our calling? Well, I think it is these things. I think, I think you've well spoken. It is eternal life, salvation, forgiveness of sins. A home in heaven, just another way to say eternal life, I think. All of those are a part of the hope of our calling, and they're wonderful things to think about, are they not? He continues on, one Lord, that being Christ our Savior, of course, the head of the church, as we've already read in Ephesians 1 and verse 22. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, okay? So one Lord, all of us have only one master. Okay, one Lord, one master. And then he speaks of one faith. We have this one Lord who is the object of this one faith. And we often speak of ourselves, as the scriptures do, of people of like precious faith. He goes on to say one baptism, one way of entrance into the body, if you will. Remember what we just read in 1 Corinthians 12? All right. For by one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. So one baptism, one way of entrance into this one body. And then he finishes these ones here by saying, one God and Father of all. Not many gods, but one. Now we understand that, but some don't understand that. Turn to 1 Corinthians 8, if you will. 1 Corinthians 8. Back to the book of 1 Corinthians. I mentioned uh, a couple weeks ago, and this is no mystery or whatever, not anything that we would not expect. I think we would expect it. As Paul wrote to the various churches that he wrote letters to, that he would say some of the similar things in these different letters as he wrote to different bodies of Christians in different locations. 1 Corinthians 8, and let's look at verses 5 and 6. This uh, is part of the discussion when they were having the problem in Corinth of some objecting to folks eating meat that had been uh, sacrificed to idols and so forth. And uh, so that's kind of the context here. But notice what he says again in 1 Corinthians 8 verses 5 and 6. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as there are many gods and many lords... Yet for us there is one God, the Father, of whom, we are, of whom are all things, and we for him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things, and through whom we live. For there, for us, yet for us there is one God, the Father. Okay, similar again to what he says back here in Ephesians. One God and Father of all, who is above all, through all, and in you all. So, Paul says, as we read in Corinthians, that from the pagan viewpoint, there are many gods and many lords. But for Christians, there is one God, the Father, and one Savior, one Lord, Jesus Christ. You know, um, in our world today, at least I don't think we do this, okay? We don't participate in this, I don't think. You know, we don't have, uh, we don't have statues that are idols, Uh, We don't worship statues, I don't think. We don't worship 
graven images. Uh, we as Christians don't worship um, uh, cows or other animals, okay? We don't worship the sun and the moon uh, or the gods of the sun and the moon as many of the pagan religions did. But as been said in lessons many times, and I think it bears repeating, we need to be careful not to make anything else our God, okay? Our work, our hobbies, our recreation, our possessions, our pride, you know, even our families. And, and, and don't misunderstand that statement. I know we're to love and care for our families as Christians. We're to have love and have great care and concern for our families. But even our families, we're not to put ahead of our God, okay? We're not to have anything that we put ahead of our God. All of these things that I just mentioned are good and in and of themselves, but never to be put before God and Christ. In a pure, pluralistic society, we're often asked to approve many lifestyles, and accept many faiths. But the faith that God accepts is singular and exclusive, so much so that one who does not embrace it, embrace it, that one faith, is without hope. Turn to John 14, if you would. I tell you what, I asked you to turn over there, but I think many of you can quote it, okay? John 14, John, Paul, or excuse me, Jesus is answering a question from Thomas. And he says this, what does he say? I am the way, the what? The truth and the life. And no man comes to the Father except through me. I remember Mike telling this story, I believe in one of his sermons. It could have been in a sermon or it could have been in a Bible lesson he was teaching to us. I think you'll remember this, okay? You're going to remember probably the instance, the particular instance. I don't think I am, but I remember you, the, the, you telling the story that you were talking one time with, uh, I believe you said it was your time when you were out in Washington, perhaps near Seattle or whatever, if you remember the story I'm giving you, where you were talking with someone, and whoever that person was, seems to me it was a young man, okay, if I remember the story right, and he said to you that the problem he had with Christianity was that it was so exclusive, okay? Do you remember that, okay? And uh, I remember being impressed with Mike's answer, okay? That when the gentleman, young man, was a young man, okay? Said to you that, you know, the problem I have with Christianity is it's so exclusive, exclusive, okay? And Mike's answer to him was, yes, it is, okay? All right? Christianity is exclusive, okay? All right? There's only one way to the Father. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through him. So in that way, absolutely, Christianity is exclusive. Now, we're not to be exclusive, and I know Mike didn't mean it that way in the way we treat people. We're to treat them with kindness, with mercy, with respect. Um... But we should not deny, and we don't want to deny, that no, Christianity is exclusive. There's only this one hope of our calling. There's only one way to have that one hope of our calling, through the Christ, through the Savior. So absolutely, Christianity is exclusive. And we don't want to apologize to people over that, about that. We want to... We want to explain it in the right way. We want to explain it kindly and gracefully, as I've said. But is this true? Christianity is an exclusive religion, okay? All right? There's only one God, the Father, and one Lord Jesus Christ. And the only way to God the Father is through the Christ, okay? Knowing God and having assurance of a saved relationship gives us everlasting consolation and good hope by grace. Those aren't my words, by the way. Those are the words of 2 Thessalonians 2, I think it's verse 16, that we can have everlasting consolation and good hope by grace, okay? And the hope we have is not an incidental comfort, it's a treasured assurance that gives us an anchor for our souls, and that's mentioned in Hebrews 6 and verse 19. Okay, so all of these ones here, I again think give us a foundation for this unity. 
that we're supposed to have. I do think we need to talk a little bit about this one baptism, okay? I think good, um, good Bible study requires us to talk a little bit about the one baptism, okay? And make sure we understand that. I think we do understand it, but to make sure we have a good answer and to, uh, good understanding and to make sure we have an answer if someone asks us, ever asks us about this one baptism. And what I mean by that is this. The statement that there is one baptism could be confusing to one who reads of references to several baptismal acts in the Bible. There are references to several different, several different baptisms in the scripture. There are references to several different baptismal acts, as I just said, in the scripture. And I think we should recognize those and we should be aware of those so we can make sure we understand what we're talking about. Once again, if anyone ever asks us, uh, what does it mean, one baptism here, when I read about a number of baptisms uh, in the scriptures? So let's study that a little bit. Let me ask you, what, what other, we're talking about one baptism. And I just said, I think my note said, I just think that this is the baptism that ushers us into the kingdom, that ushers us into the church, okay? And so I think we know what we're talking about there. But what other baptisms are mentioned in scripture? Excuse me? The baptism of fire. Thank you, Bertie. We're going to read about that in just a moment. We're going to confirm that Miss Bertie is exactly right, that the scriptures talk about a baptism of fire. We'll read that passage momentarily, okay? So thank you. What other baptisms are spoken of in scripture? Can you think? Excuse me? John's baptism. Okay, Mike says, absolutely. Okay. That's another baptism that's spoken up in Scripture. We'll go back and read about that just a, moment, just a few moments again as a way to make sure we're doing good Bible study this morning, okay? Can you think of any other baptisms that are mentioned in Scripture? Baptism of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Steve. Absolutely. Came upon the apostles' win. Came upon the apostles' win. On the day of Pentecost, absolutely. So the baptism of the Holy Spirit, another baptism that's mentioned in scriptures. We'll read about it to make sure we confirm that in just a moment or two, all right? Any others that you think of? There are a couple or three more, maybe. Let's read about, let's read about all of them, some of which you have mentioned, some of which you haven't. Turn to 1 Corinthians 10, if you will. 1 Corinthians 10, back to 1 Corinthians. We're spending a lot of time in 1 Corinthians this morning, but let's read of another baptism. 1 Corinthians 10, and I think you'll remember this one. 1 Corinthians 10, and we'll read verses 1 and 2. And this is about Moses, all right? And it says this, Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. All were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Talking about the time in Exodus, which is exactly what our kids are going to be studying about, okay? The escape from Exodus, okay? Um, this big sign we've had out there in the vestibule for a long time, the escape, okay? All right? The deliverance from, uh, from uh, slavery, I think they're going to be talking about. You're going to have characters like uh, playing uh, Moses and playing when you come to the plays that we adults will see and playing the Pharaoh and some other folks, okay? You might recognize them. You probably will, but that's who they'll be playing, okay? So that's kind of what this is talking about here. So this is talking about, we read here of the figurative. It's a figurative immersion. It's not an, an actual immer immersion here. A figurative immersion of Moses and the Israelites in the cloud and in the sea, all right? How about this one? We didn't mention this one. Turn to Mark chapter 10. Mark 10. Kind of mentioned, I guess, uh, kind of, and maybe ties, ties in with the baptism of fire, which Bertie mentioned to us. Uh, but Mark 10, and let's read verses 38 through 40. This is when James and John, the sons of Zebedee, come to Jesus. And they ask that they may set one on his right hand and the other on his left hand in the kingdom when it comes, okay? All right? 
Uh, and Jesus says this to them, beginning in verse 38. But Jesus said to them, You do not, what, do not know what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink and be baptized? There's baptism. And be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They said to him, We are able. So Jesus said to them, You will indeed drink the cup that I drink. And with the baptism I am baptized with, you will be baptized. But to set on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but is, it is for those for whom it is prepared. So here, the immersion of Jesus in suffering, that's what Jesus is talking about. The baptism he'll be baptized with. His immersion in suffering on the cross and all the things uh, before the cross and so forth is referred to as baptism. And interesting enough, Jesus says that James and John will be baptized with the same type of suffering. Were they? Were they? Ryan shakes his head yes, okay? All right. How were James and John baptized with the same suffering that, or at least similar to the suffering that Jesus was baptized with? Excuse me? Okay. James was. James was beheaded by who? Who beheaded James, okay? King Herod beheaded James. So James was, he was baptized with that same suffering. John, of course, was cast into exile on the Isle of Patmos from which he, where he was when he wrote the book of Revelation, okay? So indeed, they were baptized with the same baptism of suffering or at least a similar baptism of suffering. Mike mentioned the baptism of John the Baptist. We know this, but turn to Luke chapter 3, if you will. Luke 3. And verse 3. And this is speaking of John the Baptist. And it says, He went into all the region around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Um, his baptism of repentance, which of course later ceased... Steve mentioned the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Turn to Acts chapter 1, if you will. Passages that I think we're familiar with, but we should remind ourselves from time to time as we think about these different baptisms. Acts 1, and let's read verses 5 through 8. Maybe beginning with verse 4. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So twice here in this passage, Jesus tells the disciples, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit in verse 5. And then in verse 8, but you will see, will receive, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, okay? Uh, and again, as we just mentioned, we know that happens. We will continue reading over in Acts chapter 2, and we'll see that happen with the disciples being baptized um, with the baptism of the Holy Spirit, okay? Bertie mentioned the baptism of fire. It's one more that we can read about. Turn to Matthew chapter 3. Matthew 3. And let's read verses, well, Matthew 3 and verse 11. This is um, John the Baptist has come and he's preparing the way for Jesus. And in chapter 3 and verse 11 he says this, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he is coming after me as mightier than, mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire that Bertie was speaking of just a moment ago. So, there are a lot of baptisms mentioned um, in the New Testament, okay? 
Uh, but this is back in, uh, all these baptisms have ceased. But this one baptism spoken of back in Ephesians 4 uh, is the baptism of immersion in water, we know. Which, again, as we've mentioned, ushers one into the church and the kingdom of Christ and which resembles the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. The baptism commanded in the Great Commission, uh, which continues until today. The Great Commission given in Matthew 28, of course, and Mark 16. Okay, so just some ideas to make sure what we know, that we know what we're talking about when the passage here says one baptism, okay? All of these other baptisms indeed are mentioned, but they have all ceased. And we're talking about the one baptism, the immersion in water, which brings us into the church. Okay. All right, now, so, a lot about those ones, which continue this discussion of unity in the church. Let's go now to verses 7 through 16. See, Mike, I'm actually covering more than three verses this morning, okay? All right. <laughs> okay. Can I pause you? Huh? Yes, you can. See, you're interrupting me now. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Uh, you know, there's not many in Christendom today that would argue for, you know, John's baptism. Right. I don't think I know of anybody that would right. argue that we need to go back to John's baptism. There yeah. are some that would argue that we need to be baptized with the Holy Spirit, especially within the Pentecostal movement. Um, it, it, but it seems like a lot of Christendom wants to except baptism as a demonstration of faith, okay. as an outward sign okay. of our faith. Right. And, you know, we've been accused in, within Churches of Christ of making baptism a work. And, you know, I, I think we continue to see pushback from greater Christendom when we look at, when we call for baptism for the remission of sins. And I even see, you know, younger preachers struggle with like, for example, um, I was on a preacher's group on Facebook recently where the preacher was saying a deacon at his church, his father was on his deathbed, the facility wouldn't let him be taken to a baptistry, so he poured water over his father and called it baptism. And I was actually surprised to see a lot of younger you know, preachers appealing to the emotion. Well, he couldn't get him to water, so that is sufficient, which was very surprising to me, you know, to see young preachers within the Church of Christ accepting that kind of reason. Okay. You know, and I just think it's, it's important to emphasize that if baptism, if the one baptism wasn't important, Paul would not have included it in that list. Okay. So it's, it's every bit as important that we understand the baptism as it is that we understand there's one God, that there's one spirit, that there's one body. You know, those things are essential, and they're essential to you. You know, and, and I think, you know, accepting a plurality position on baptism, you know, is not going to bring about unity. And so I guess I'm just, I'm just bringing this out to say this is a big deal. We need to understand the one baptism. We need to, you know, hold our ground on this. Okay. I see younger people in the church, you know, being pulled into this plural thinking nature, you know, and, and we have, we are right on this. You know, we are right to emphasize you know, baptism is important. And, and we certainly have no authority to change that one baptism, to alter it according to human positions and human understandings of Scripture. So I just wanted to bring that out because it's, it's good to look at all of the baptisms that are there in Scripture. But let's also remember that there are other teachings about baptism that are practiced today that are not that one baptism. Okay. And we're, we're right to emphasize it. Okay. All right. Just wanted to bring that out. Yeah, absolutely. Well said. I'm not sure if everyone could hear, hear all that Mike had to say back, uh, you know, throughout the audience this morning, but, and I'm not going to be able to repeat it all, but it, basically we need to stick to this one baptism, which is the immersion in water, okay? All right? And what its purpose is and what it constitutes, and we need to stick to that, and we need to not give in to some of the winds of teaching, if you will, and that reminds me, actually, of a passage we're just getting ready to read, okay, all right, uh, that are out there, and we need to stick to the truth of the scriptures about baptism, all right? He said a lot more than that, but that's exactly right. Uh, and that, again, is the purpose of good Bible study, 
to make sure that we understand these things. That's part of the purpose. This is later on in my notes this morning to make a point about something else. That's part of the purpose. Yeah, we have to do our own individual Bible study. There's, not, there's no doubt about that. But that's part of the purpose of, of meeting and assembling like we are right now to do good Bible study and to make sure that we understand this. As a matter of fact, the whole time Mike was saying that, and it might not be exactly what this is referring to, but it seems to me that it's somewhat referring to. We're getting ready to read chapter 4, verses 7 through 16. But part of what it tells us is this, part of what 7 through 16 tells us is this. It talks us about us becoming mature. I'm getting ahead of myself now, okay? Because uh, we're talking about before we actually read the passage, although we've already read it once a couple of weeks ago. But it talks about us mature, becoming mature. It talks about us growing in the faith. It talks about us growing up. It talks about us... Uh, having understanding. I don't think that word exactly is used, but that's the implication of this. And it says that we should do this. Look at verse 14. Verse 13, before we read the entire passage. Till we all come to the unity of the faith. Okay, back to this unity thing again. And back to understanding all of these ones. And back to understanding the importance of this one baptism, exactly what it means. And then it says something. This is what part of what What you said reminded me of this, because I knew this, we're getting ready to read this verse. In verse 14, okay? All right. It says that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. Okay? You know what Mike said, if you couldn't hear him in the back, he's, even, he's hearing people in the church talk about that there are different forms of baptism, not, not just immersion in water, okay? And that seems to me, I don't know what you think as I'm listening to say this, that seems to me not being mature enough in the scriptures, not having a great enough understanding of the scriptures, that we then become children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine, Okay? I don't know if that makes sense to you or not, but as I was listening to your explanation there, that makes sense to me, okay? That we have to have a solid knowledge of the Scripture. We have to grow into maturity in the Scriptures. We have to grow into understanding of the Scriptures, and we need to study them over and over and over and over again. I remember a couple of weeks ago we were talking about beating uh, Uh, bearing down on these things and even beating on these constantly so that we have an understanding of these things so that we're not tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine that comes up. You know, so maybe I'm not going to end up reading 7 through 16 this morning, but we're reading part of it anyway, and we'll go into it next week. But so much wind of doctoring and trickery and craftiness is thrown at us today, okay? Not just in that manner, in that manner too, but so much of it is thrown at us. And if we're not mature enough, and if we don't grow up enough, which are phrases that are used in 7 through 16, okay? If we don't read them this morning, we will read them next week, okay? Then we're going to be deceived, by these winds of doctrine and these craftiness and deceitfulness, the scriptures say, okay? It is the perfect point of individual Bible study, but why we need to go into deep Bible study in our classes, and it's the responsibility of elders to feed the church of God, okay? To shepherd the people over which we have been given uh, the responsibility to do that, okay? Does that make any sense to you? That's a, that's a, that's, that's being thrown to and fro by every wind of doctrine and many other winds of doctrine. Go ahead. I, I was just going to mention one. Oh, go ahead. Yes, ma'am. Absolutely. When I was growing up, Mother never knew anything about the Lord or church or anything. But she told all of us, and it hit me really good, she said, take it when you go out in this world, like even mm-hmm. in high school, she said, live a good name. She said, do not great disgrace yourself or any of us in this family. I mean, she didn't even know the Lord. 
And she was telling me to live a good life. Okay. All right. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's, that's, that's telling us common sense. Yeah, yes. come. What got me, she didn't know the Lord, and she still wanted me to be live a good life and, and trustworthy and all that. You know what she was given, though? She was given some moral values by the God of this world. That's what she was given, okay? All right? Uh, I could get into some of my uh, uh, Christian apologetics, okay? Uh, bell's going to ring momentarily, and I need to let Mike speak again or whatever, okay? Um, one of the ways that we know that there's a God is something, certain moral things are put inside of us, okay? And they wouldn't be there without a creator, okay? It's one of the evidences, quite frankly, of the existence of a God, okay? All right, we could get into that, but that's a little off topic. Go ahead. I, I was just going to say, on my recent trip to Vanuatu, one of the encouraging things was how grounded the church still was there and how it had become more grounded. It had grown, and they were still standing firm. Um, and what I've observed in the church in the U.S. is all of a sudden I see some brethren that are over there, uh, not speaking of left or right, just they're over there. They're different. They're somewhere else than where I'm at in my faith. And I like the, the 414 analogy because the wind has blown them over there. Right, right. You know, and the only, and the only thing that I can think of is what, what holds one person here on the lake and blows one boat over there on the lake <clears> is one boat is anchored. The other boat is not. Yeah. And, and I think that's such an important thing for us to realize is, you know, if you look up and you see some people that are suddenly blown over there, something changed. By every wind of doctrine. Uh, and something has blown them okay. over there. Yeah. You know, and, and that's, a, that's a significant issue. You know, if we're going to have unity, we've got to be anchored in the same place. Absolutely. And that's back to having outstanding Bible study, okay? The passage is going to talk about, we won't have time to read it this, this morning. The second bell just rung. But we will begin right here next Sunday, okay? And the passage is going to talk about equipping each to function properly in the church, okay? Equipping every saint to function properly in the church so that the church functions properly. It's a critically important passage, a critically important passage because it also leads to unity, okay? And again, you're going to see these words. You can read them right now. And you're going to see the words. The King James will use the word perfect to grow to a perfect man. But it doesn't mean perfect. Other translations are better here. Other translations will say grow to a mature man or woman. Mature in the scriptures. Okay? Mature in our understanding of God's teaching. Another word that will be used here. And, 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 and as adults, we don't like this word. Okay? Another phrase that will be used in this passage we will read, it'll say, grow up. Now, I, you know, I'm going to have to be careful how I look at a bunch of adults and say, hey, grow up. Okay? But I want to remind you, it's not me saying that. It is the Apostle Paul saying, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, grow up. He's talking about, and, and, and didn't we just read, don't be children anymore. When I was a child, I thought as a child, I acted as a child. I'm going to misquote the scripture. I did all of these things, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. I misquoted that passage, but it's something similar to that anyway. Okay? All right? So we can't be children. We've got to be mature people. And we need, this is what this passage is going to tell us as we are equipped to function properly within the Lord's church. We will read that and study that in detail next Sunday. Yes, ma'am. Absolutely. Back to Ephesians 1 and verse 1. It's part of living a life worthy of our calling, is it not? Back to 4 and verse 1. All right. Thank you for your attention. 7 through 16 next morning. I want you to notice that what took up a lot of time this morning was comments from our brother Green. Okay? I just want you to notice that. Okay? So when I get accused of going slowly, I want you to know that brother Green has something to do with that. I must Just, have been here in spirit the last two absolutely, weeks. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. All right. <laughs> uh, uh.
Yeah, yeah.